So he's looking down the microscope and he says, look, he said, I'm looking at a snapshot of a living heart. So you, you, he was looking at the resurrected Jesus heart. Yes, yes, yes. This is Touched by Heaven, everyday encounters with God, those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God. Do we see God in the microscope today? Hmm, this is interesting. Hi, welcome to episode 239. I'm your host, Trapper Jack, I'm talking to Ron Tessarero today. This guy's been in the midst of science for the last 30 years. He's actually an attorney who got really involved in things like, well, like in this episode, you'll hear about a, a bleeding statue of Jesus, and it's bleeding real human blood, real DNA, except, interesting, seems to have a biological mom, but not a biological human dad. How does that work? Unless, huh, is that possible? Or a woman in South America who has the wounds of Christ, the stigmata, and boy, what we learned there. So here's a guy after my own heart who sees that, that science is on our side because God created the science in order that we see God in the science. It's also a pleasure to be able to share my story with people like you of, of the same mindset, which is great. Uh, I, am, I am so of the same mindset. I am always baffled at, uh, you know, when we have the science on our side, how silent we are. Absolutely, and that's what makes this story so incredible, and I can um, um, reveal a bit more of that in the course of our, our interview. Right. Ron, an attorney, one of his neighbors is also like the father of investigative reporting in Australia, Mike Willisey. So he goes to Mike and he says, you know, I, I've got all this God science stuff here, and uh, what do you say? You want this story? What do you say we do this stuff together? And Mike says, he has, I have no interest. This is all fraud. This is, this is all fake. And, and Ron says, prove me wrong. Let's, let, me give you, let me give you these stories, and you prove me wrong. And it was life-changing for Mike. Well, that man who was so skeptical came away from uh, what I'd introduced him to in these stories I was examining and changed his life. He then worked with me for 20 years afterwards on some of the greatest stories that you will hear about. But the point about it was that he he was exceptional. He 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 had that that quality about him that was that when he found the truth, no matter how difficult it was to tell, he went out of his way to tell it. And and for a journalist of his caliber to be proclaiming that God is intervening in our world and science is confirming it, uh, took a lot of um, courage to do. When a, when a news guy puts himself, he puts a target on his back. He really does. Exactly. And the other side doesn't even care about the facts. They just, oh, you just, you've just said you're one of yeah. those people. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the one thing, well, there were two big stories that, well, all of them are big, but two really big ones that came out of our involvement was the investigation and the presentation of the uh, sick martyr of a person in, in South America, which became the subject of a major Fox Network program, Science from God, that was broadcast um, throughout the world in 1999, where we um, we were able to film the prediction and the happening of the stigma of a person in a way that's never been done before. But the interesting thing is that the person who is the who had the stigma or the stigma was a is a mystic who um, we have studied for 20 years. And I deal with it uh, at length in, in my book, My Human Heart, where science and faith collide. Carty predicted on film the day and time when she would next have the stigmata, two months away. She said that Jesus told her the day it would happen again and that we could film it for all to see. And also for me, yes. Gracias. Thank you very much. To our surprise, it did happen exactly as she predicted. We filmed the whole event. Welcome to Fox Studios in Los Angeles. What an honor it is to work alongside you. Thanks, Giselle. I understand from all the noteworthy work that you've done over the years where you're renowned for your skepticism and investigative abilities, this is not only different, this project we're about to see has been extraordinary for you. It started seven years ago for me through a lawyer who started this investigation and I simply did not believe most of what he told me. A lot of things have happened since then. It's been an extraordinary journey 
and I'd like our viewers to join us on that journey. It formed part of a Fox Network special program, Signs from God, that was broadcast to 29 million viewers in the United States alone. Everyone was able to see how from nothing deep bleeding wounds progressively formed, as if she had been nailed through her hands and her feet, like in the crucifixion of Christ. She suffered pain. At 3 p.m. the wounds began to heal. By the next morning they had completely healed, contrary to medical opinion. Now, I don't believe any microsurgeon in the world could heal those wounds so smoothly in less than 24 hours. In the back of this hand, this is just after 24 hours later from the start of the day, nothing that you can see. Well, it's medically that's impossible. From what we saw yesterday, it is quite impossible for those wounds to heal like that. And if you look at the feet also, Ron, and also you notice if you look closely that the wounds have healed in a most unusual manner. They draw in. It's almost like something in internally draws it all together from the inside. And summing up yesterday, what would you say? God was present. It was amazing. Miracle. And her story is remarkable. It's, it's almost like God chooses through history individuals and gives them a charism like we found with St. Catherine of Siena. St. Catherine of Siena um, had the stigmata. Um, Jesus dictated to her theology. There's, there's this, this, this and, and gives to them the means by which they can guide society in their times. And that's what we found in this story with this person who had the stigmata. There's 80 books of theology that she's written. Wow. And uh, when you read them, they just uh, you just think, hey, God is here talking. But most importantly, we study this case, which I want to focus on a bit because I'm sure your audience will be riveted by it, and that was our investigation of the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires. Okay, but first I want to preface this with something about the Bible. One of the things that finally got me reading the Bible that made it interesting and fascinating and fun is when I heard about typology. Typology connects the Old Testament to the New. It's going from 1.0 to 2.0. You're getting an upgrade. What happened in the Old Testament? Look, it's happening again, only it's a type. It's a type. Moses was a type of Jesus, who also fasted in the desert for 40 days, who also went up the mountain to talk to his father, uh, who also had something to do with the law. Remember coming down with the commandments and Jesus said, I fulfill that law. Or take a look at I Abraham and Isaac, right? There's going to be a sacrifice. Isaac carrying the wood on his back up the hill and it's he's going to kill his son in the New Testament. Of course, it was stopped there, but in the New Testament, it wasn't stopped. The son carrying that wood up that hill and was sacrificed. Or take a look at, the, at that miraculous bread that fell from heaven, manna. And then in the New Testament, you get the upgrade. You get Jesus calling himself the living bread from heaven. So there at the Last Supper, he's holding that bread and he says, this is my body. And they're going, what? What are you talking about, Jesus? This is my body. That bread, it looks the same. Yeah, it's been changed. This is my body. Can you actually see that happen in a microscope? Back in 1996, a priest found an abandoned communion host in his church after Mass. And normally a priest would consume the host because um, it's sacred, that's what you do. But if it's soiled or it's not appropriate for the priest to consume it, they normally put it into, a, uh, into water uh, and allow it to dissolve and then do something. So the priest put the host in water and then locked it in the tabernacle until it would dissolve. After a few days, it was noticed that a blood-like substance was coming from that host. The bishop organized for the photographers to come and to film it after a week. They locked it back up into the tabernacle. The, 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 it, it looked like there was blood and some other substance coming from that host. Well, that was in 1996. In 1999, I was given permission with some another person 
to go and do uh, an investigation on that host. Um, at that time of the, the investigation, um, Pope Francis was the prevailing Archbishop of the city and he was the one who authorised the testing. To, to cut a long story short, we took pieces of the material out from the, the, the host and then began a series of scientific investigations on it. I, I was very conscious of the fact that no one is ever going to believe the story. Therefore, I had to film and document every aspect of the investigation uh, of the witnesses so that any other person who was not present during all of this happening could see what happened. Then when we took the samples, we were given, were given complete freedom to have them examined. So we started with DNA testing and then pathology testing. I'll go to the pathology testing because this is where I think history was history was made. May I ask you a question at this point? Because mm. uh, I've always wondered about this, about uh, these kinds of investigations. What part of the host do you get to take? I mean, you, you mentioned it's like coming out of the center. So you aim for the center in terms of a, a, a sample or do you have to cut off an edge? How does that work? Um, well, in this particular case, the host had completely dissolved. In fact, it had been sitting in water for three years before we actually took it for examination. The original photographs that were taken during the process of the transformation showed the host in its, its de decomposing form. You first see the host breaking down in the photo, in the progression of photographs. Then you see it almost congealing into a darker substance with red all around it. So when we got to do the sample, it was like, um, how would I describe it? It was like, uh, oh, it's hard to imagine, something about the size of a pea um, in blood that was congealed, and that was a, it was a, a darker substance. So we cut into that darker substance and took a piece from that. So it was, it was actually, it was three-dimensional. It was not just liquid. The film footage shows exactly where we cut it and, and the piece that we took away. So the, the filming shows, answers each one of those questions you ask, where it was taken from, how big it was, and how we moved it from one spot to another. Then after it was put into a test tube, it was labelled, it was signed, signed, co-signed by all those present so that we could establish the chain of evidence because I knew being a lawyer and knowing I have to defend a case, that I'd have to be able to demonstrate against the worst critic that that what we examined ultimately was in reality the thing that we took away. So I had to follow that path. So we then go, we decided to go to have a forensic pathologist examine it. Now, I, I emailed to us to a um, forensic pathologist in, the, in, in New York that I had a, I was working on a case and it was important for me to be able to identify the material that's in a test tube on a microscopic slide. And I, I do it this way so that I don't have a prejudice from the person examining it. And it's fortunate that I'm a lawyer because I can use this not incorrect statement, but one that slightly deflects the, the line of thinking to say I'm a lawyer working on a case. I need to uh, it's confidential, the, the, the case. I need to know the identity of the material that's, uh, that I need to have examined. So he, he um, said, okay, bring, come to New York, bring it with you. With you. He um, accepted us in and um, he I, I took his microscope out, out and I, I, I was able to film the whole process of us handing to him the sample to look at, him looking down the microscope. He's, and, he, and he had no idea where this came from, he was prepared to take it on a blind test so long as we told him the story afterwards. So he's looking down the microscope and he says, look, I can tell you exactly what this is. Heart tissue. Uh, there's a inflammatory infiltrate here. The heart tissue itself is degenerating, is degenerated. In other words, this is what happens sometimes after a, a, a heart attack. Now, there's other things that can cause this type of a item that resembles a heart attack. You get it from 
a person getting beat up across the chest. The injury hit this area of the heart, right here. The heart is one area that I know. Yep. This is my business. And what's the function of that part of the heart? That's the left ventricle. That's a major uh, area that pumps the blood to all parts of the body. Now, what's the history? Okay. We're investigating the potential of this being a Eucharistic miracle. A communion host was found abandoned in a church in Argentina in 1996. Somebody picked it up and instead of a priest consuming it because it had been on the floor and was dirty, they placed it in water. It was put in the tabernacle. When it was taken out a few days later, there was a blood-like substance. Then when the blood-like substance appeared, they thought something is happening here, so they put it all into distilled water. That is amazing. How long had it been in the water in all? Three years. That tissue was in water for three years? Yes. That's hard to believe because the tissue in here shows good fixation. And it would be amazing. The big thing about it is, that's really so funny, here it's heart muscle. But those cells are not normally there. Translation, he is seeing white blood cells. Those inflammatory cells are not normally there. They come in as a reaction to injury. Where did those cells come from? These cells have to come from other areas of the body in order to do that. This is heart tissue. This is part of the tissue of the heart, sort of close to the left ventricle wall. It's, it's been infiltrated with white blood cells. White blood cells tell me two things. One, that this heart was alive at the moment the sample was taken. And secondly, this heart has suffered trauma because the white blood cells come in to address the trauma in the tissue. So here he is looking down the microscope. And, and this other thing was that he says, I can, I can tell from the arrangement of the traumatized tissue and the multiplicity of white blood cells, I can date the timing of this event. event. He said, I'm looking at a snapshot of a living heart. But I can tell that it was three days before this moment of this snapshot that this heart suffered the trauma. And then I thought, this is strange. Then afterwards when I spoke to a theologian, I said, look, Jesus suffered the passion, you know, it was a, during the morning of the day of the crucifixion. And then um, he was crucified at three. So where do we get this three days business? And he said to me, do you realize that we as Catholics believe that the Eucharist is a memorial of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ? When we receive communion, we receive Jesus at the moment of the resurrection. So this Eucharistic phenomenon is revealing this, this belief that we have that Jesus is alive in the Eucharist, but that he is the same person who suffered three days before from the Passion. So there we have a, a momentous finding because um, it, it has all sorts of interesting ramifications for us and our belief in Jesus present in the Eucharist. So he was able to say, I'm looking at a living person. This injury occurred three days before what I'm looking at now. And, and the, here's that's so striking is that, okay, this sample was taken while the person was alive is phenomenal yes. in itself. So you, you, he was looking at the resurrected Jesus heart. Yes, yes, yes. Think of the ramifications of this for the church. But not only does Jesus give to us his body and blood in the Eucharist, he gives to us his heart, his heart, the, the, the core of the divinity, this incredible, the essence of him. You're about to receive Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the creator of the universe. He's the one who will stand in judgment at the time of your death 
to determine whether you are eligible to go to heaven or not. But yet this Jesus, this God, this King, descends to us in the form of, a, of the communion to give us the opportunity of placing his heart next to yours as a foretaste of what's happening in heaven. Think of the magnitude of that. There would be traffic jams going to Catholic church masses if people really believed in what the church teaches and what now has become evident through science in this Eucharistic miracle. Because there's no other explanation for it. God is giving to us an incredible gift and is giving it to us so that we can see through science the magnitude of this gift. And um, and so um, I think that, um, you know, we're only just speaking. When theologians reflect upon what's happened, they will have the ammunition to rebuild the church's belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. You know, listeners to my podcast know that I, uh, I am always more than puzzled, as you are, that, what you just said has is is virtually never spoken of from the pulpit. No, no, it's almost like we're embarrassed because we, you know, look, it's very hard in this uh, intellectually minded progressive society to talk about God being in a piece of bread. Come off it, that, you know. No one believes in that sort of stuff anymore. People would say that's impossible. It can't happen. And you and you and that stuff in the Bible, you can throw that away because it has no relevance to modern day life. I say, show me a book of science that can explain what's happened where a piece of bread has turned into flesh and blood. You can't show me. But I can show you a book written 2,000 years ago where some character talked about bread and wine becoming his flesh and blood in the very circumstances under which this has happened today. So it is relevant to our understanding of something that's happened today, more relevant than any other document, any other book, in any library, in any university, anywhere in the world. Is there Number anyone one, in the secular world beating down your door? I've only, in the last uh, few months, released the book that deals with this subject matter, and that documentary that you just saw has only been released in the last few days. So it, it has the essence of my argument, and I dare say that... Um, it will strike an accord. Well, I mean, it has to because there's, there's no other way about it. But the but the next big question is this, is that when you look at the textbooks on evolution, they say, look, you know, the life has come about through a process of an evolutionary process where simple forms have evolved into more complex forms so that you get, you know, from previously what was bacteria and after 3.5 billion years you've got a man. And I say, take, for example, the, um, the heart today can only exist if it has gone through a process of evolution from, it was first a one-chambered heart, then a two-chambered heart, three-chambered heart, and then ultimately a four-chambered heart in the human. So in the Eucharistic movement of Buenos Aires, we've got evidence of a human heart, four chambers. But there was no preceding evolutionary path from lesser forms of species. So you can't say as an absolute the heart can only have forms through that evolutionary path if you have one instance where it's happened without any form of evolution. And, of course, Darwin himself said if ever it's ever demonstrated a complex organ existed that did not follow that evolutionary path, my theory will fall down. He said my theory will absolutely fall down. And, of course, my argument is... Um, it, on, on his own test, it does fall down because you can't possibly argue that the preceding antecedents to this heart that this man saw down in the microscope had 3,000, 3.5 billion years of evolution to that point. How, how do you feel being in the middle of all this? Well, I feel, I've been 30, it's funny, that's, I've amortized it over 30 years now. <laughs> amortized, so. you've amortized, I like that word. And how do I feel? I feel privileged in many ways, but that privilege comes at a very severe cost because it's difficult to assert and deal with these this type of phenomena in a world that doesn't want to hear about it. You know, one, I'll give you one example of the, the, the type of uh, bias you can find. When we were trying to get into the detail of more about this Eucharistic phenomenon, 
we went to, Mike Willis and I got on a plane, flew to Germany, and went to visit a, a, a notable um, scientist in the University of Gottingen in Germany. And we wanted them to um, do a blind test and examine our Buenos Aires sample. Um, they um, they said, oh, yeah, okay, we will do that. Um, but you have to tell us the history of it. I said, no, look, it's, it's important for us to have an unbiased, unprejudiced examination. We wanted it to be a blind test. And they said, no, we won't do, do this test on that basis. Now, Mike Willis and I had flown all the way from Australia, all the way there, and we get knocked back at the door. So my friend, Mike, said, look, let's, we better tell them, otherwise, you know, we're not going to get anywhere here. So we tell them what we suspect is the story, that this has come from a Eucharistic phenomenon. And they said, no, we won't do this test. I said, why? Because if you're right, if this turns out to be true, we have to close down half this university because we are, our university is based on the promotion of neo-Darwinism. And this is, runs contrary to the whole concept of a piece of bridge to turn into flesh and blood, human, etc. So we won't do it. So, so, so much for objectivity in the scientific world. We've learned within faith, we've, we've kind of expect that, don't we? We expect that from the secular world. But on the other hand, inside the church, inside faith, you sit there and you still see the same quiet, the similar quiet. You, you, oh, have, a church, you have a church that 70% of Catholics don't believe that's Jesus, and, and we stay quiet. Yes. You know, it's, it's, um, it's really hard to believe. I, the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires in 1996 was the first of a run of current Eucharistic miracles that have happened in, um, uh, in Poland, twice in Poland, in Mexico, um, and, and well, of course in Lanciano in the 8th century. Ron is talking about some particular Eucharistic miracles of late that we've talked about here. Tixla, Mexico, 2006. A Eucharistic minister, a nun, is about to distribute the communion, and she sees this one particular host that seems to be seeping something red. In time, they hand it over to the scientists, the doctors, who say the same thing as they all do. It's heart tissue, type AB blood. It's a suffering heart. There's white blood cells coming to the rescue. But what makes this one makes this one really interesting is that this is seeping blood from the inside. Definitely, there's a point in the in the center of this Eucharist in which the blood is pouring out to the rest of the host. 2008, Sokolka, Poland, during a mass, a Eucharist falls to the floor. So they put it into water so it'll dissolve and it's no longer Eucharist anymore. A nun is put in charge of this and she puts it into a safe and comes back a week later and she sees this stain on this host. So the priest puts it on a cloth for it to dry out and this stain is there and ultimately they have it investigated by two different pathologists who say the same thing. This is, this is heart tissue. Again, but what's really interesting about this heart tissue is is the interweaving of heart tissue with bread. This this is like the flash moment. You know, when the priest says, this is my body, this is the moment. You have bread there, but you also have this heart tissue. Type AB blood, suffering heart, white blood cells, again and again and again. What we believe is the sacred heart of Jesus Christ. Eucharistic miracles. But the interesting thing, is each of these Eucharistic phenomena that have occurred in recent times, there's this consistency of, of the heart and trauma in each of these miracles. So for those who want to say, well, you know, in, in science, you can have aberrations and one thing happens and you know, until it's, 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 it's happened somewhere else or that, you know, you can replicate the event, then it's, it's of no value. So one Eucharistic miracle before resulting in what's happened is interesting, but multiply that by four, and it's mammoth. It's like a revolution that's occurring in our world that the science at some point of time has to stop and acknowledge. It has to be front page news in the cardiology uh, journal that you can have this type of thing happening. It's a reality. So that's number one. Secondly, the point I want to move to next is that we've done DNA testing on the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires, and we also did you could. DNA testing on the statue of Christ was crying and bleeding in Bolivia. No one, no one can explain, for example, in the case of that statue in Bolivia, 
how the statue is producing human blood. It's producing, it's taking on all the characteristics of a of a person who has been traumatized. And the scientist who none knew nothing of the story said, it seems to me that this is this is uh, uh, tissue from the facial area that has been traumatized as if been beaten by a blunt object and has become mixed with the blood. So all of this coming from a statue. Now, what we've then proceeded to do is to look at the DNA analysis of both the blood from that sweeping statue of Christ and the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires. First of all, in both cases, there was human DNA, but no human genetic profile. Translation, in this human blood, in the DNA, they see roots to a mom, a biological human mom, but they're not seeing dad, a human dad. Now, if we had got a genetic profile of that type in those tests, then you'd have to say that this couldn't be from Jesus because he didn't have a father through sexual union. He doesn't have a human genetic code, and therefore it's presented in a mystery situation and and an anomaly because no one, to my knowledge, has had human DNA and not have had a human genetic profile from the nucleus. So we then proceeded in our testing to go to mitochondrial DNA testing, which is to look at the mother's line and the mother's ancestral line. And it was there that we found riveting information in both cases which accorded with each other. Now, I've just kept all of this at the moment to one side because I see the next logical progression in this DNA analysis of the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires is for comparative testing to be done on the blood on the Shroud of Turin because if the Shroud of Turin is genuinely a burial cloth of Christ and has his blood on it, then that blood must match the genetic components of the Eucharistic miracle of Buenos Aires. They have to match. And so that's the next part of the of the process I'm hoping to pursue with the cooperation of Pope Francis. I've written to him asking for his cooperation and, and demonstrating that this is, could be highly beneficial for the church in its understanding of everything about Jesus and everything about the Eucharist. Let's pause right about here. Then more of this fascinating conversation with Ron Tessarero. His book is My Human Heart. We'll talk about that again in a second. We also have a, uh, a link to his video that includes all these stories and more and everything, too, in the show notes here at episode 239 of touchbyheaven.net. More coming up here. Quick Patreon shout out. Thanks, George. George Hicks is part of our Patreon family and makes this all go. Uh, I am told that the way to um, talk about something you're passionate about is don't talk about what you're talking about. Talk about why. Why do we? Why is there a touch by heaven? Uh, this episode says why there is because it's just a great example of a flare gun going off, these collisions of heaven and earth, and it's important to wake people up to the science. You know, it's funny. We follow science when we feel like it sometimes, we uh, scientists even follow the science they want to follow and try to ignore, <laughs> ignore the science that is saying truth. But I, I don't like that science. So let, let me look in a different direction. And here's just, it's just, we just want truth, don't we? That is, that's the why. We just want people to see these collisions and understand that God is saying, am I getting your attention? Because I love you. I made you. I love you. I want you back with me. Yeah, I know you're in exile right now down there on that, in, on that earth place. And I'm showing you the way back to heaven. And it's just, that's, that's so much of the why. It's just helping people see to open up their spiritual eyes to go, oh, there is a God in a world that right now wants to tell you that there isn't. <laughs> and there is. So that's why we do what we do. Patreon.com if you want to help us out to keep it all going. Patreon.com, search for Trapper Jack, or you can come here at episode 239 at touchedbyheaven.net. I want to get back to Ron here, who, uh, well, uh, in, I, I guess I should ask you, this is the, the, the starting point for, for you caring to do uh, this yourself. What drew my attention firstly to this question of coincidence was the, the story of the three children at Fatima in 1917. 
And so I, I thought this is rather odd that we've got the God intervening in our world in a very demonstrable way. Some people have called it the most his, most dramatic and historic intervention by God since the time of the resurrection. But no one talks about it. And I thought to myself, you know, he, God gives a peace plan to the world and the United Nations and all the countries of the world sit together year after year, year after year, trying to work out how to get peace in the world. But no Catholic stands up in one of those audiences at the United Nations and says, hey, how about having a look at the peace plan God gave us that would prevent all of these things that were happening, all these wars that are happening? Don't you think it's worth a try? Then I realized that there were things happening in our world today. I would love to have someone like you, Ron. I'd love to have someone like you. You know, every now and then you'll flip by on YouTube and you'll see some atheist debating some Christian and they go back and forth. And it's like, I always felt like all you'd have to do, whether it's a Eucharistic miracle or plop down uh, all the technology and science in Our Lady of Guadalupe, for example, and just and just speak about that because there's nothing they can do with that. <laughs> you know? That's very true. That's the well. Uh, look, it's it's early days yet, and I'm sure God has His time. But you know, it's interesting. You should talk about the Our Lady of Guadalupe. That was something that really struck me, and I went there specifically to look at it. And I interviewed the scientists involved in that um, who did the work on it, and um, and what was amazing. Uh, is that uh, I'm, I'm quickly trying to look through the book to get the quote I got from the from that scientist, and you, you, you and you think why is this well why isn't this well known? In October of 1996, my own curiosity drew me to Mexico City to film an interview with Jorge Escalante, an ophthalmologist and surgeon who had practiced as a specialist for 42 years. He spoke with insistence and conviction of his latest findings. The eyes have all the characteristics of a human eye. It has all the parts. It is a snapshot of an eye alive with all its interior parts, like another human person. We are dealing with a human eye. It is not a picture. It is not a painting. It is impossible to have been created by man artificially. And I read the next bit. The next subject I interviewed was Jamie Mauson, the well-known Mexican TV presenter, who had produced a film on the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe for 60 minutes. From behind his desk, he said, I did not believe in this miracle. But when we did the program for 60 minutes, we realized there were many things that could not be explained about the image, especially the eyes. We put a big lens close to the Virgin. I was alone looking at the eye. I saw the eyelashes. Then I saw the blood vessels, all the veins. Then I looked into the into the iris, into the pupil, and I had the sensation that I was seeing a live, a live eye. I felt inside of me a voice that asked me, what do you want from me? It was very shocking. I was seeing a live eye. I don't normally speak about my private emotions, but I have to say that I realized that the, at that moment, whatever was there was alive when that image was created and was alive then and was looking at me. That is the sensation of what I had. Whatever, whatever is there is still alive. Now, that's nice, isn't it? It's a live. The eyes are alive. There's so much there. Wow. Uh, it's a smorgasbord of information on that on that um, yeah. uh, Lady of Guadalupe image. Um, however, I mean, you can't do everything, but that was just one of yeah. them. God is certainly alive and well, and he's truly trying to show himself to a world who doesn't want to look at him. I always ask my guests, what's the takeaway? So if I were to ask you, with all of this work that you're doing and are showing, uh, what's what's your takeaway, Ron? My takeaway is that um, uh, there's a God there who's desperately trying to att attract our attention, that it's relevant to our world today, both in terms of how we deal with each other, how we deal particularly with world peace. Um, and I think that... Um, that the answers, so many of the answers to the to the question the world is asking, will be found through knowing more about him. But I want to tell you this little story because this mm -hmm. was a, an important change in my life in a way, in this in the same direction. Um, I had made a documentary on the, the mystic in Bolivia, and I was I had to present it at a 
a conference in Miami on the Saturday, and it was the Thursday back here in Australia, and I was preparing to get ready to go. And I'd been going like mad trying to finish it in time. And um, so I said a prayer. I said, Jesus, look, the last thing I feel like doing now is getting on a plane to go all the way to America and back again in a couple of days to present this documentary, which is I'm worn out from doing. I just hope you're watching. You know, you know what I'm doing because, you know, I've got no idea that whether you know it. And I'm only doing it for you. So, you know, I just hope that you, you do know this. Anyhow, and so as I was saying that prayer, I was in my bathroom getting organized to leave. I was packing my, my um, uh, bathroom things like my toothbrush, toothpaste and toothbrush and all those sort of things. And in true military style, I would reduce the weight of everything by taking what I don't need, taking, leaving what I don't need. But I just purchased a can of pressure pack shaving cream, 250 grams. Um, I'll just take enough shaving cream for one shave till I get there. So that was, no one in the world knew those thoughts, saw me doing those things. That was what happened in my bathroom. As I said that prayer, I'm doing it all for you, Lord. I hope you're watching. So I go to America, present the documentary in a conference. The mystics got for me a, a present, nicely wrapped with a bow on it. I open it up, and guess what? It was. It was a can of pressure pack shaving cream, exactly the same size, the same color, the same shape, same brand that I left back in Australia. How could you possibly know? She didn't um, respond at first, and then she weakened and told me. She said, "Look, I was, I went to this shop and I was looking for something to buy for your present." And I said a prayer. I said, "Jesus, please help me to find something that one needs." She said, after she said that prayer, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned around, and there was a shelf with shaving cream on it, so I knew how to get that. Then the priest who was with her said, can't you can't buy shaving cream for a present? That's, that's offensive. And she said to him, Jesus told me that's what one needs, buy it. So that's how it turned out. <laughs> I but love what, that. But what that. What that taught me, though, Trapper, is this, that when you're in your bathroom and you think you're alone and you talk to the God, you know, Jesus, I know you are here. You can hear me. Because you heard me like this once before. You know, I know you're hearing me now. And I think that um, that's if, if we, we had that depth of faith to know that the God who created us knows us by name, watches us, listens to us, and wants us to communicate with him, and he's thankful for the things that we do for him. And by the way, I can't wait for this book and the uh, this latest book to be converted into uh, an audio book, and you'll be the first person I send it to. <laughs> you're, so, eh? you're a sweet man, Ron. You're a sweet man. Yeah. Uh, and this the title of this one is, is called what? Uh, the, this latest book is called My Human Heart, Where Science and Faith Collide. They, if anyone wants, they can go to reasontobelieve.com.au and they'll see it on my website there. Okay. And the new documentary that you saw, it's entitled The Eucharistic Miracle of Buenos Aires, The, Im the Impact or Darwin's Downfall. It's either under one of those two subheadings. Right. And we'll put a link into the show notes too on that one. Thanks, Ron. He's right here. Isn't that amazing? He's right here. He's in the shaving cream. Yeah, he's in the shaving cream. He's... And he's right here. He's with you. He's with me. And he's right here. And the flare gun going off. And he helps us look into a microscope. Isn't that great? Help us as doubting Thomases. And we go before Jesus and we say, can you make this physical? Can I put my finger into your wounds and my hand into your side? Would you help me out a little bit? And actually, and actually Ron has an answer for that too. The, uh, as, as we all are doubting Thomases at some point. My journalist friend, uh, didn't really, uh, wasn't really taken by the story until he witnessed the this, this stigmata. The, um, we were there to film it, watch it. And he more or less came away like Thomas, that having experienced that, it was like being there, Jesus showing his wounds to Thomas, because Mike was Thomas at that time. He was a, a journalist. He was, he was, um, he was not fully convinced until that event of witnessing the stigmata. And he came away believing, just like Thomas, that you know God had shown 
his hands and his feet and his side and his passion. God is trying to show the world what he did for man, his suffering. He showed it through the suffering of the stigmata, through the so the statue of Christ that's crying and bleeding, um, and obviously through the Eucharistic miracles, then ultimately the Shroud of Turin. He's demonstrating to us what we have forgotten about him and um, and the Thomas story in a way. Thanks again, Ron, for showing us a statue that uh, bleeds, bread that bleeds, a woman who bleeds uh, with the wounds of Christ. Thank you for uh, helping us see God shooting off the flare gun. What is your story? Let me know here at touchedbyheaven.net. Thank you mo- so much for your, for helping us out through patreon.com. Search for Trapper Jack or here at episode th- 239. You can uh, link your way through. Also here in the show notes at episode 239 at touchedbyheaven.net, Magigoria pilgrimage.life. We're going back at the end of May. All the information is there. In fact, if you book by the end of 2022, you can save 100 bucks. So check that out. Magigoria, M E D J U G O R J E, pilgrimage.life. Okay, do you want to do it again next week? I, I think I'm here. Might, let me check my schedule. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. Here at uh, Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. I'm Trapper Jack. That's that's the name I'm using today. I used to just use the word bacteria. So that you get, you know, from previously what was bacteria, now for 3.5 billion years you've got a man.